last four years. Brendan Marks, college basketball writer for TheAthletic.com, joins us on 365 Sports. Brendan, thanks for your time. We appreciate it. How much fun will this be, uh, the, the final four with all the different storylines, including what is NC State and DJ Burns? Yeah, you know, for me, this is like my Christmas. Uh, I love the NCAA tournament and the fact that we have both elements of what I think makes a great Final Four. Obviously, you've got the chalk at the top. You've got UConn. You've got Purdue. You've got two teams who have been basically in the top five of every poll, every metric all season long. But then again, like you mentioned, you've got a true underdog. You've got one of these Cinderella's in NC State. And to some extent, Alabama, too. Um, you know, top four seed. I don't know if that counts. But you put all that together. I, I can't wait. I think the games, the matches themselves are fascinating. Like, I wish I could fast forward to Saturday. Brendan, as a person who this is their Christmas, you know, we talked to Brett Yormark last week and, you know, I asked him about, you know, expansion of the tournament and he said it would be modest. How do you feel about the potential of it, potential uh, of ex expansion? Yeah, you know, I, I think that, you know, if I had a perfect world, I wouldn't touch the NCAA tournament. You know, I think that it is the best post season in sports. I think, you know, the fact that you don't always have uh, you know, perfection, you know, like over the course of a seven game series in professional leagues, in the NBA or in the MLB or whatever, you know, you end up ultimately most of the time getting the better team. But in the span of one forty minute contest, that's not always the case in college basketball. It's what makes upsets great. It's, what, it's why we love March Madness. And so to me, like it doesn't need to be toyed with. Um, ultimately, though, the people who make the decisions, the people who are in charge of the money, they're going to expand it. Um, it's basically inevitable at this point. I would argue that the, the the most minor expansion is probably the best case scenario for everybody involved. I think we're probably going to see that first four turn into something like a, a first eight, basically. I'm not expecting there to be huge changes, but you know, for people like Greg Sankey, SEC commissioner who have said, you know, our teams don't have fair access. Like NC state to me is a perfect example this year. NC state was not making the tournament if they didn't win five games in five days in Washington DC in the ACC tournament. And they did that. They're the second high major team to ever win five and five. 2011 UConn was the first. And they have earned the right to play in the tournament, and they've earned the right to keep playing from then on. So to me, I would rather not change it, but uh, as little expansion as possible I think is best for the tournament itself. So, Brendan, right now, not only just on the men's side, but the women's side as well, seems like the, the, the combination of the two are about as hot as it's, it's probably ever been. Uh, certainly on, on the ladies' side, a lot of talk and buzz, especially after last night's game. But uh, both sides uh, have a spot of interest right now in Raleigh, North Carolina, as you wrote about for The Athletic. Uh, two teams in the Final Four. Uh, what's it like in Raleigh, North Carolina right now? Yeah, honestly, you know, uh, for, for years, NC State fans have said they were cursed. Uh, you know, basically ever since the Wolfpack won the national championship in 1983, they've, they've kind of just been languishing in like this miserable sports nightmare. And so the fact that that has kind of been lifted, uh, it's crazy. I mean, you see, you know, when I flew into RDU coming back, I was in Los Angeles with North Carolina for the West region, which obviously Alabama ended up coming out of, but when I flew back into RDU, it was minutes after NC State had won, and they already had the LED signs changed. I walked around NC State's campus yesterday. It's like, you know, Kevin Keats couldn't be the uh, bigger rock star over there right now. So it's just really cool to see, like, a school like that that has been suffering for a while in terms of sports fandom finally get an opportunity. Um, I have no idea what's going to happen this weekend on the men's or the women's side, but just the fact that NC State is included in that, like, you have a generation of fans who have kind of been living off of a memory or off of a story, and now they get to experience it themselves. Um, that part is really cool just to be you know, in close proximity to. That is funny that you say the, the way you say it is a story because 1983, for every single student that's not you know, coming back to their you know, second thing in life, uh, that's what it is to them. Like they're, it's stories their parents and grandparents have told them. So it's not a memory as much as it is a, a thing they see painted on the wall. So it's, it, it, it's a completely different thing. Yeah. And, and, you know, like there's this uh, classic NC state bar that opened in like 1950, 1951 called players retreat. And when Joe Valvano was the coach, he used to go there. He had a, a quote unquote booth that was his and he would basically hold court there. And you walk into Players Retreat today, which I did yesterday, and it's still all those same old photos. It's cardiac pack bumper stickers. It's license plate. Like, that is the way that, that NC State fans, at least like the current generation, knows about, you know, that 1983 run. And obviously the, the documentary and all of the stories they've heard. And 
there's a number of figures from that 1983 team who are still around campus. Um, I, I think, you know, I was gonna, I was listening and trying to listen as best I could to a couple of tours that were going on around campus when I was walking around yesterday. And, you know, one of the, the parents of a student who I guess was potentially going to enroll was asking the tour guide, you know, what is it like being a student? And she was saying how great it was. And then asked, did you go to NC State? And he said, yeah, I lived through that. And, and she said, I know you've been waiting 40 years for this. So it is really cool just to have it happen like that and to have it in a similar fashion to that run in 83 obviously makes it that much more special. Brendan, as you know, I contacted you trying to, to get you on last week. But, man, the, the media sessions and the coverage, it was, it was just not the right time. So when I reached back out to you and then I saw your story, about your father uh, and where he was buried in a cemetery in the same cemetery as Jim Valvano and also Lorenzo Charles. And there's the tweet we put up. There's the Valvano headstone. Uh, wow. I mean, how that connects to you too. Yeah. I, I mean, uh, I mean, I remember when we buried my dad and as we were you know, going through making all the processionals, it's kind of like a, a quippy one liner. If a funeral can have the like a funeral home, can have the, <laughs> they, they, they kind of throw it in like, Hey, and by the way, Jimmy V's buried here. Um, and so now, you know, after I obviously is a, a sports fan and a sports lover myself, like every time I go to visit my dad on the way out, I just take one extra turn and I go past Jimmy V's headstone. And usually there are, it, I have never been there where there's nothing at his at his gravesite. There is usually some flowers or a ribbon or a letter. Um, you know, for a while there, there was a basketball where somebody had etched "Never Give Up" like into the ball, and it had faded from orange to white because it'd been out in the elements for so long. But I figured, I, you know, no better time to go than yesterday. And you know, I've never seen it that packed. And and I probably should have tweeted out a photo of Lorenzo uh, Charles's gravesite as well because he had some flowers and had some autographed flags and things down there but it, it's just overwhelming how many nc state fans are still going back to that gravesite i saw one twitter user responded to me and said that she's been going there and dropping off flowers every game pre-game is like a superstition so i mean i cannot emphasize enough to people who are not from raleigh north carolina like how much nc state collectively is an athletics department and school has been chasing the magic that Jim Valvano summoned back in 1983. They've been chasing it for 40 years. And so the fact, again, that it's happening in a similar fashion that it has been, you know, what is it, nine wins in 20 days now after a team that was 17 and 14 in the regular season, like pe people are going back there and it feels like if there was a curse that was lifted, it, it feels like or if there was a curse in general, it feels like it's been lifted now. And um, it's pretty cool just to see the outpouring of support still for the Valvano family. One of the things that we had Gary, uh, Gary Hahn, the voice of NC State, who's retired or trying to retire, but is surely <laughs> enjoying the fact that he has at least one, maybe two more games left. Uh, and we brought up 83, and then he said – and He's an elite, elite club to be a part of. And so, obviously, again, 83 gets all the headlines just because it was so memorable and everything. And um, but, but there have been opportunities. Like, NC State has had good teams since um, – I, you know, if you had asked me a month ago, where does this stack up in the last decade of NC State teams? I don't even know that I would have said it was in the top five. Like, but but again, kind of like in '83, this team has has caught some magic. They're playing with house money at this point, um, and I think strictly from a basketball standpoint, they're a really difficult matchup to plan for. In especially if you have a one day turnover, but even in a three or four day turnover just because they have so many different pieces and so many different combinations. And, you know, that's part of the fun of this whole story, too, is all the different characters. Brendan Marks with us, TheAthletic.com on 365 Sports. The Final Four coming up, of course, this weekend. What would you have said was the status of the coaching staff at 17 and 14 compared to now, now when they're talking extension? Yeah, well, so, you know, I'll, I'll be honest with you guys, like, I went to the ACC tournament on Tuesday in Washington, D.C., the first day when, you know, there's quite literally dozens of fans in the stands um, because there was a good chance that if NC State had lost its first game in the ACC tournament to Louisville, which obviously fired Kenny Payne basically immediately after the season ended, if NC State had lost that game, which it trailed at halftime, I think there's a very good chance that Kevin Keats also would have no longer been the coach at NC State. And so to go from that, to being, you know, the center of all of these job conversations. And players are outwardly being asked, you know, what do you think about the status of your coach? What's your case for keeping Kevin Keith? Yada, 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 on and on. And 
Now, by virtue of NC State having made it this far, by virtue of NC State having won the ACC tournament, Kevin Keats's contract has several provisions in it. Excuse me. He's already been granted a three-year extension. He's already been granted a four hundred thousand dollar raise, and he's already made several hundred thousand dollars of bonuses too. So, <laughs> I, I mean, I mean, if NC, I'm, I'm not kidding here. If NC State wins two games in Phoenix this weekend, I would not at all be surprised if the man gets a lifetime contract. I'm serious. <laughs> To go from to go from being on the brink to that, it would be one of the most incredible coaching stories of any sport that, that I've probably seen in my lifetime. It is just miraculous the turnaround and the perception of Kevin Keats from you know late February to now. Brendan, uh, when it comes to having both teams still alive in the tournament, I know UConn has that uh, as well. Uh, how does the, I, I guess, the share of the kind of love go around? Are the men kind of soaking up most of the headlines or are the women getting their fair share as well? Like, so, what is sort of the balancing act you feel like across campus and throughout Raleigh right now? Yeah, you know, I, I think obviously the um, improbability of the men's run has sure. played a big role in the attention that they're getting. Um, and obviously after they won the ACC tournament, which the women did not do, um, you know, that was a big selling point. You know, ACC tournament shirts are still, you know, going like hotcakes here. However, like over the last five to seven years, the NC State women have been by far and away the better of the two programs. Like it's not even close. Um, the woman won three consecutive ACC tournament titles from 2020 to 2022. In 2022, they also they swept the ACC. They had the regular season as well, made the Elite Eight, lost in pretty controversial fashion. Uh, to UConn in a game that was played in Connecticut when NC State was the number one seed playing a de facto road game. Uh, so the women's program has had crazy support over the years. I would argue they've, they've probably had better attendance over that span than the men. So certainly the women are getting their shine. And I think it's been cool to see, too, like the men and the women continue to shout each other out. Uh, the women's game, they, they qualified for the Final Four a couple of hours before the men did, right as they were getting back into their locker room. And you know, both the men and the women were FaceTiming each other after they won their game. So it, it's cool to see it be split equally. And, you know, again, they both have really tough tasks waiting for them in the Final Four. But, uh, you know, I'm as I said, I'm, I'm done, Pat. I'm done picking, you know, anybody but NC State. I, I just – I'm done being wrong about thinking NC State's going to lose. Well, it's been a great story. And the, the, the footwork and the touch, uh, what DJ Burns has brought to the table, he against a seven-foot-four guy – will be interesting. Uh, Brendan, uh, you can hear and feel the passion of college basketball in your voice. Uh, thank you very much for being a part of the show. Glad we got a chance to get you on and go enjoy your Christmas this week. Absolutely. I appreciate you guys. I hope you enjoy all the games, and uh, we'll see how it all takes out. We will absolutely do that. Brendan Marks, the Atlantic, uh, Athletic.com with us. Uh, and the 